Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody's relaxed from lunch. Yeah, actually, I met some new faces here. I wanted to make, make sure people knew. I'm not just, they see the name manager, and they figure, well, they can't talk to me about issues with the product because I won't understand them because I probably don't program small talk. But I want to assure that, <coughs> like a number of, I mean, there's people who have been doing it longer than I have, but I started uh, with methods back in 86, small talk V, V286, VPM, master's thesis in the in the 80s and writing PetriNet simulators and small talk. So um, I've been doing it quite a while and I don't get to do much coding anymore, but if you start telling me about things or issues with tools and things in our product, I'll, I'll understand what you're talking about. So welcome. First I want to say thank you to all the, the organizers of the of this conference. Um, the Innovation Awards is, is something unique to this conference and is always my favorite part because I think innovation is still such a large part of what small talk is about. So this talk is going to outline basically some things about, about Syncom small talk products. I, I love these boxes, by the way, but you will not actually, even if they're only virtual, she, so you won't actually receive boxes like this, but you will get some disks with some, with some shiny graphics on them. So I want to talk about our three products. Before I do, I want to mention some of the other um, talks put on by some uh, Syncom employees. You, you probably saw Bonding with Pango this morning, um, Xtremes, which was done uh, Monday by Martin, and Stampy, which was done, I believe, on uh, Friday by Martin. Uh, Alan is giving a talk about Store on Friday. Uh, uh, many of you attended the Wolfpack programming session, which was uh, an interesting experiment and a way to get some, some hands-on with web velocity. <coughs> and I think uh, Jason and Julian are doing uh, one or two more talks also, so, so look for those. So I'll also mentioned partners like Georg talked about uh, using the COM interface uh, uh, this morning. So we're going to talk a little bit about our products what we've been doing over the last year, and specific changes for each of our products, talk about what's coming in the future, and do a little show and tell about a couple things. <coughs> so once again, our favorite boxes. So I, I was here a year ago at ESUG, I was in France, and a whole lot has happened past then, uh, since then. We've had three major product releases, and two maintenance releases in that amount of time in just one year. So let's talk a little bit about the products. First of all, all three of our products run on the Syncom Smalltalk Foundation, which is basically the VisualWorks virtual machines and the core libraries from VisualWorks. So we try to take uh, advantage of the strength and maturity of that core, and by putting all three products on top of it, all three of them get to exercise the core and continue to you know, make sure it's working right and improve it. And of course, we get some benefit from some from reuse. <coughs> so let's talk about what we do to improve the product. First, what are we trying to do? Well, our, our first focus is on customers. We want to make sure that we give the customers what they need to be successful to justify continued use of small talk and to build new applications. Put new things in the product, build, build new things, upgrade old applications, spread the use to new, new parts of their organization, and, and to attract new customers, sure. But our main focus is on making sure our current customers have what they need as best as we can. <coughs> so what kind of product improvements can we make? We can add brand new features to the product, which is helpful in some, in some instances. We can refine, enhance, uh, make changes and updates, fixes to old features. We can do foundational, basically prerequisite work, which a lot of time is, is needed. We'll recognize an important area of the product we want to get from where we are now to and add some important benefits in the future, and we need to get some foundation pieces in place so we can build on that. And we use the foundation pieces, so it's really important to get right, but our customers also use the foundation pieces. 
So again, it's really important to make sure those pieces are correct. And, and we try to make sure we don't want to make just uh, knee-jerk decisions and put things out that, that can damage the ability of our, our customers to use the product successfully. We also do cleanup. We um, sunset things that are no longer used in the product. We try to take some frameworks that are still used and move them onto uh, uh, modern bases w uh, when it's necessary. Uh, sometimes we, th we see things that are no longer you know, as good as they should be and, and do some refactoring. So a, a whole lot goes on just in, in addition to just shiny new things to the product. And a whole lot we need to make sure that we keep, you know, we don't break things in a way that, that hurts our customer's ability to use it. So there's also what other kind of changes are there. And if you think about it, there's disruptive and non-disruptive changes. Some disruptive changes are inherent. Uh, we moved our VM, all our VMs now are Unicode based. So doing that, there was some potential for some subtle, some subtle er errors to creep into the product. So we wanted to make sure we had long enough to, to flush those out. There's also uh, disruptive changes that we can avoid, like coming out with you know, huge new, completely changed frameworks that, uh, that cause too much work for our customers. And we know small, ta small, small talk is not one of those mainstream thing that is you know, every, you know, everybody, it's in all the, the big magazines, but we are a super successful niche. And niches can be really large and really successful. We're not one of those mainstream players. So one thing as product manager that I recognize and from experience recognize is our customers often get pressure if they go to their management and say, we need a year to you do this port because it's just so much work. The man their managers might say, well, people are telling me we should use this Java stuff that other people are using. So maybe we should just, instead of doing the port, do this. I want to avoid that situation. I want to avoid putting our customers into that kind of situation because it's, it's bad for all of us. I want to get from where we are now to where we want to be, but bring everybody along for the ride, making sure they can continue to be successful and the end journey is where they want to be with you know, modern, super capable applications. So, and that takes some more planning. But luckily we have some people that are, are really good, really smart at doing that. Another thing I want to avoid is, say we recognize we want to update a framework. We could just build a completely new framework, real, real fast and sloppy, put it out there. It solves some problems, but not all of them. So now we have half the customers using the old, half the customers using the new. It doesn't solve, neither one solves every, everyone's problems. And now we have two big frameworks to support. I want to avoid that also because it, it, it doesn't help either of us in the long run. <coughs> Where do we get our product ideas from? Uh, well, we get lots of ideas from our customers, from the community, um, I'm in constant communication with engineering and support. Uh, we, we get input from sales who are in constant contact with the customers. But it comes down to customers. I mean, I, I get a, lo a lot of ideas, but I really want to validate those ideas with a customer saying, I want that. And, and certainly things like from our engineers, they have a, a unique perspective on the product and some details and know where certain areas need cleanup and things like that. But we really want to validate what needs to be done by talking to customers and making sure it's what people want. We don't want to take the arrogant stance where, oh, well, we know what everybody wants. We don't need to talk to them. We'll just do what we know they want. No, that, that's not the way to do it because you may think you know and you may not know. So we need to validate. So part of this, talk to me, send your ideas, suggestions, requirements to the product manager. I'll have my email at the end. So our product cycle, I, I often like to describe things in what, why, and how. So I just want to talk about it, just a couple things quickly. What did we do, why did we do it, and how did it work out? So one of the first things we did, and I, I was a customer, I worked for, for Park Place starting in 92 up through where they were bought out by Syncom. Then I went to work for six years for a customer where I basically ran the development. We had hundreds of applications running in VisualWorks 24-7. So 
one of the things I gained as a perspective from a customer was that we couldn't keep up with all the releases. We could only upgrade every couple of years maybe. So one of the things we didn't want to do, and both product management and engineering was just kind of coast along with the way things were, we wanted to actively and aggressively improve things. So one of the ideas we tried was a longer product length. And why did we do it? Well, customers can't always migrate to all the frequent releases. Um, and I also, uh, oh, also from a customer perspective, if I went to my management and said, I want to upgrade, it'll take uh, two months, I want to upgrade to the latest release of, of, of a small talk product. And they'd say, okay, what are the benefits that we're going to see out on the trading floor? And if I say nothing, it's just good for us to be on the latest release, blah, 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 they'd look at me like, like there was something wrong with me. That, that, that's not good enough. Unless I can tell them exactly how they're going to benefit, the answer is no. So taking that to heart, I wanted to make sure that we had specific product features added to the product so customers could go to their management when their management said, well, well what is it going to do for us? They could say this and this and this and this. Oh, okay. And they're much more likely to get that, that work funded, which is important. We want to keep our customers moving along and, and reaping benefits from doing that. So we need to make sure that what's in the newer releases is, is communicated and articulated and there's key benefits in there. So how did that longer length work out? Well, well mixed. Um, one of the things, our major release was really big. We had a lot of really great things in there, and it was actually good to have some of the extra time, because there were some potentially disruptive things in there, have the extra time to, to make sure they were working properly. Um, on the downside, it took us longer to stabilize it and get it out the door than we had originally planned. Um, and also, in engineering was aggressively improving their processes, and they were becoming much more agile. And agile says kind of more frequent releases, not longer releases. So, so what are we going to do with what we learned? I think it was a really good exercise. I, I think we learned a lot from it. What we want to try to do is, is make sure we get out the more frequent fixes and things into the product, fixes and refinements out to customers more frequently and, and um, in line with our more agile uh, engineering process, but also still make sure that we're also planning over multiple releases some larger feature benefits that are necessary for our customers. So basically, trying to get the best of both worlds, I think, makes sense. And, and I think we can do that. Um, sharpening the saws is uh, a, a statement from a, a Stephen Covey book where he talks about two uh, woodcutters with old-fashioned hand saws, two-person hand saws, cutting down trees through the forest. And the, the blade is getting duller and duller, so they're becoming less and less productive. And someone says, you know, that you should stop and sharpen your saw. We can't. We're behind schedule. And, and, and that kind of scenario probably happens to all of us here at one time or another. We're behind, but we need to do things, take care of things, but we're behind, so we just want to press on. But the best thing to do may be to stop and fix some things to regain all that productivity, uh, shar sharpening that saw. So basically we did that with engineering. Engineering worked on, on revamping their process. Uh, some of the goals that we had for that were improving the traceability, the reliability, uh, have more rigorous testing, move to a more agile scrum-like process in engineering, um, a better defined process, semi-automated builds, uh, automated testing. We also took some time to upgrade a lot of the machines and compilers and the build chain tools along the way. So a whole lot of refinement and improvements were done in engineering, and, and I think it was, it was absolutely necessary. So over that longer cycle, we took the time to do that, and that's a whole lot of work that went on that, that may not be, be known. But now you folks uh, know. So, so how did it work out? I, I think really well. It was necessary and very important to do. So let's talk about some of the, our major release improvements to the foundation piece, so there are things that potentially all our products can use. The first is a, uni, a Unicode Windows virtual machine. Um, store was, was revamped. We have a lot of customers, which I think is a really good thing, that are pushing the boundaries of store. 
and they're finding some of those edge cases and they're telling us ways to improve it. I think that's great. When I, when I went to work for a customer, I moved us from a homegrown uh, source code repository to using store. So uh, I know some of the pains and the benefits of store. People pushing it hard, I think that's great. Uh, and we want that feedback. We want to improve it and move it forward. So we really revamped it so we're much in the much more in the uh, situation now where we can make faster changes in the future and we've got a better base to build on and there's more interesting things that we can do with it. Uh, Alan will be talking about store on Friday so you can uh, ask him all your detailed uh, stumper questions. Sorry Alan. 64-bit uh, work. We had 64-bit um, products come out, virtual machines come out before and you could use them, but they weren't, weren't really ready for prime time. Uh, I mean, so some things, if you, if you push, they just broke. So we did a huge amount of work, not only on 64-bit VMs, but also on the images. There was a significant number of changes that needed to be done at the image level for those to work properly. So a whole lot went on to support because more and more 64-bit uh, people want the object space and some other advantages that 64-bit VMs can offer. And we're getting those that we're on, we're on Linux and Solaris right now. And I'll talk about more of those. Atomic loading w was part of this foundation piece. And that's where th that gets around some sequence problems in loading things. It basically loads all the things to a shadow space. And then, it, and then in one atomic move, boom, moves it into your system. Uh, delays. Delays have worked pretty well for years. But with some changes in operating system, systems along the way and some, some new needs, they were breaking in some interesting ways. So we have an alternative implementation of delays that relies more on the operating system resources. And if, uh, if the operating systems are automatically making adjustments to the times, the uh, delays will still work properly. And they have some other unique properties, so check those out if those are of interest. There were uh, more and more people are using uh, the, the Macintosh uh, platforms, and we made a number of improvements to the virtual machines on those. We integrated uh, a new prerequisite engine into the product. Actually, I should mention one thing on the, on the Unicode. Um, marketing asked me for a list of changes that we made in the product to, to communicate some of those to our, our customers and, and potential customers. And they got them, wrote them up, sent them to another marketing person who did a spell check, and then sent it out. So I'm really happy to announce we are the only small talk vendor with full unicorn support. <laughs> oh, what I'm thinking is maybe, the, maybe this marketing person decided the best way to grow the small talk community was to go after the, the female preteen demographic. So I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, pink and purple browsers, but you know, whatever we can do to grow the community. We, we still chuckle about that. In, in our dot release, we had some new things in the foundation. Uh, a completely rewritten and revamped merge engine based on some pretty neat algorithms. Um, a, a brand new comparison tool that looks really nice. Check it out if you haven't seen that. Uh, improvements with Store. Store doesn't have its, its own unique browsers. They're, they are RB based now. Uh, garbage store, garbage collection moved to a Glorp base and a number of fixes and cleanup to store uh, were done for the, for the dot releases. Uh, we integrate the latest version of, of the Seaside frameworks into, our, uh, into our, our releases. So this was a maintenance release, but you'll see with the products there were still some, some key things. So here's Object Studio and those, those lovely boxes. With Object Studio 8.2, first it got the, the foundation improvements that I just discussed. The modeling tool was kind of revitalized and improvements made to it. Really, the, the modeling and mapping tools are, are key features to what differentiate the Object Studio IDE. It's, it's a very Windows-centric platform and has this, this UML, UML-based modeling tool. Uh, so, so for people at the architectural level who want to start there and, and have that kind of development process, this is a great tool to use. Our mapping tool moved to our, our latest, greatest 
OR mapping technology, Glorp, a lot of you know it as. <coughs> um, this is kind of a lower level detail, but I thought it might be of interest to this crowd, and that we move the Windows messaging loop from, from in C to in Smalltalk, and we were able to solve some, some longstanding problems that we had with uh, some, some, while you were in the debugger, from some events getting out of sequence. Uh, fixes and refinements. Uh, all the products had, at the major release, new professionally designed logos and icons, which you see on these, these, these pretty boxes and the CDs. And Object Studio 8.2 was the first, I, I still believe, the only Vista certified small talk available on the market. So, I mean, I think that's a good thing. It gets, it gets some more visibility and credibility for, for small talk in general. For 8.2.1, which came out recently, that, that moved to the latest foundation product. Uh, the C to small talk migration work has been continuing. We're doing a lot of work there where things are basically black boxed in C. We're making it available in Smalltalk now, so that's uh, both for our customers to be able to do more things and also uh, for us to be able to extend some of the capabilities as well. Uh, lots of refinements and fixes. We are working with some customers to improve the migration story and also making sure that we have, have uh, vendors available uh, for those who want assistance and say, say moving from an Object Studio Classic to an Object Studio 8.x. And Object Studio 8.2.1 is Windows 7 certified. And I believe the only Smalltalk. The, uh, the C to Smalltalk migration work is really also important for, for what we're doing with Object Studio with, with a better Windows API to do, to do more things and the GUI updates we are doing in the future. Web Velocity, I, I hope a number of you got to, got to see the, uh, the, the Wolfpack programming experiment which use Web Velocity. Uh, quickly, Web Velocity is a web-based IDE. Uh, it allows you to quickly to build database to web applications and have very complex uh, object models underneath them. So you can do, you can do the, the, the quick and dirty things, but also then stepwise refine your product. So, so if, you're, if your boss comes in with an emergency, we need, we need a, a, a new web application to support a worldwide web application for handling some issues with our products. You can have that running in a day, the basics, and you can stepwise refine it. You can start to make enhancements and improvements, write some CSS to make it you know, pretty, so you can get it out there, get it working really quickly, and then add a lot of sophistication into it gradually as you have time. Um, it's built on a core of a VisualWorks core, Seaside, it leverages Seaside heavily, we're getting lots of people saying for years, Seaside is so great, why aren't you guys using it? And, and this was part of the response to that. Uh, it uses Glorp, um, it uses the active record pattern. So, so the, the first target we had was kind of going after what Ruby on Rails does, where they'd have like a 15 minute build a blog server. Well, well we can do it in five, basically the same kind of thing with this. So, so we think we've, we've met that challenge and, and we offer a lot more interesting things, and, and we've got tools. Web Velocity 1.1 is basically our, uh, another major release for Web Velocity. Um, it is focused on, on cloud deployment. So uh, if people want to de uh, develop a service, uh, software as a service solutions, run them in the cloud, do development, do deployment in the cloud, you can do all those things. Uh, we make it really easy to do with Amazon Web Services, which I'm going to, to show you some of. Uh, Amazon RDS, which is a, a MySQL derivative, is supported. It uh, has a headless GUI, so it runs on more serv servers. Now we're having a, a, a UI come up would be a problem. It has greatly enhanced editing tools, colorization and other things. Uh, it can actually, it'll, it'll recognize small talk code, JavaScript code, CSS, and be able to parse those properly with peg parsers. Um, collaborative editing, and, and this is some, we have ideas for, for future directions where we might go uh, with more collaboration, and you saw some of that with, uh, with the Wolfpack programming. But you can actually, I can actually be working on a method in Web Velocity, and, and, and you can be working on that with me, looking at that method, and when I type and I pause, you'll see the changes instantly, you know, semi-real-time, 
on your machine so people can work together in some interesting ways and we're trying to, to see how we can make the, make the most of those. Visual Works. Visual Works 7.7 first got that, that important foundation upgrade and what it offered. One of the real big features, we had a number of customers saying, you know, we're selling in this, this, and this market. We want to sell in a whole lot more, but we don't have what's necessary to do that. We need much heavier duty internationalization support. So our internationalization starting with 7.7 is CLDR based. Um, and we literally went from like 14 locales to uh, potentially hundreds based on the CLDR um, library. Our 64-bit platforms uh, I mentioned made a, a, a large number of changes, lots of changes to make that a, a real option now for customers. Uh, com, I think some of this started in 7.6, but COM was revamped and has some really nice tools. So you can do, if, if you, anybody saw uh, Georg's talk this morning, he talked about interfacing with Excel, doing neat things with Excel. You can write to Word, you have business solutions, or if you have fun things, I think if you go look at uh, some of uh, James Robertson's screencasts, he, he interfaces with iTunes, things like that. It has some really nice tools for discovering and experimenting with COM interfaces. Really nice stuff. If that's of interest, I highly suggest you check it out. We also made it so you could integrate ActiveX components into VisualWorks Windows, important to a number of people on the Windows platforms. New icons and logos, we put a grid into preview and we want to do more with that. We want your feedback. VisualWorks 771. Now this is a maintenance release, but we have a few